Well, good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody make it through the storm okay? Well, I'm glad you guys are here, and I'm glad that you've joined us this morning. I have a few announcements that I do want to share with you before we kick things off this morning. One is uh, the Fall Festival. It's coming up really fast. Um, October 27th is, is when that is. We need people doing trunk or treats and uh, lots of other things, lots of other volunteer uh, places there. We need candy donations for that as well. So if that's something you want to get involved in, make sure you see Cindy. And, and last week, we mentioned the Men's Low Country Boil. Um, that's going to be moved to a future date in November. It was going to be this coming Saturday, but with all the hurricane cleanup going on, uh, we're going to delay that until next month. Speaking of the storm, um, hopefully most of you have power back and things are kind of getting back to normal. Um, Brent's been putting crews together to go out and, and help. Uh, I think there's going to be a trip planned in the future, but maybe you are wanting to help out. Um, we have a section in our app right now. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of IDES, but anytime uh, Brent has organized a group of guys to go to help in another location, it's been through IDES, which is International Disaster Emergency Services. Um, you can go on our app and there's a link to their website and you can donate to them directly or go help them directly if you'd like to. There's also a link to a place called One Kingdom, which is uh, a ministry up in North Carolina who has an Amazon list. You can order specific things that those people in North Carolina and Tennessee need and they'll be shipped straight to them. So if that's a way you feel like you'd like to help out, make sure you check that out. But let's, uh, let's stand to our feet this morning and I just want to say a word of prayer. And we're going we're gonna to get loud with some praise in here this morning. But God, we just thank you so much. We thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you so much for your blessing. We thank you for this church family and the fellowship we have with one another, that even though a storm like that blows over, God, we're here giving you the glory and praise because that's what you deserve. You deserve all of it. And I pray today that our hearts are open to the, what you want to say to us and that you will move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing loud this morning. Let's lift our voices. Jonathan sang this song with you guys a couple weeks ago. Let everything, Let everything that has been, that has been. Praise, the Lord. praise the Lord, praise the Lord.
of Jesus. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Morning, church. Morning. About last week, right? Last week, a little rough. There was like a hurricane rolled through or something. That was fun, right? Wasn't that fun? Hello, Florida. I saw a couple of memes. Um, one of them was uh, living in Florida, walking outside, trying to figure out which chapter of Revelation we're in. <laughs> right? That was pretty good. Uh, there was another one. Um, I want to make sure I get this one right, so I wrote this one down. Um, stop telling people you can live off the grid when one day without power and AC, you broke. Like, you're done. I don't want to be here anymore. This is a terrible idea. Okay? Seen a couple of those going around. Um, and also, I saw one. This is great. Saw it too late. But it was, uh, before you lose power, make a list of what you love about your family. Because five minutes after losing power, you will need to refer to that list. <laughs> All right. Woo. Uh, but I hope everybody's doing well. Um, everybody's, who does not have power? Who's, anybody not have power? We win again. We win again. Yes. <laughs> yes. Seven years ago, it was six days, and I said, never again. So I bought me a whole house generator. So, I mean, we're doing good. I mean, don't feel bad. We're doing good. But we would have won again. So, <laughs> oh, my goodness. But it's fun. It's good. This is life, right? Um, and all of this, it reminds me. Like, every time I go through a hurricane, every time. We live in Florida. We go through them. I'm always reminded of a couple of things in the Bible. Noah. Like, I'm reminded of the story of Noah where, you know, you're faithful. He heeded the warning. There's some rain coming. Nobody listened. He got into his boat. God shuts the door. And then you hear the rain. And then you hear the people. You know, you hear the people, oh, no, help save us. No, you had your chance. Right? You had your chance. Um, in the Bible, same way, you know, we think about the message of the Bible, which is Jesus. And that there's another storm coming. And you don't get to just kind of live through that one. Okay? There, there's a storm coming, and that's life or death. That's heaven or hell. That's for eternity. And Jesus gives us that shelter from that storm. Okay? And we're warned about it. We're warned about it so much. I mean, man, Facebook has been popping off with people fighting over gas cans or bread. You know, y'all all bought up six cases of water. I guarantee you ain't drank one yet. <laughs> you know? Like, we freak out and we get all this stuff, and then all of a sudden you can't handle it. But you were warned, right? You were warned. This is going to happen. You know, and we do the same thing as humans and as Christians. We do the same thing. We're warned. You know, we are called to live a better life. We're called to live for Christ. We're called to be that example. But we start sweating inside that house, and them kids just going crazy, and you're going to start snapping off. Right? We go from preaching the love of Jesus to putting out that shield and spear and just ready to just, bow, give me something, right? <laughs> That's what we do, but we just have to remember. We have to remember what it's all about. We have to remember that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was because we're not perfect, because we're going to do that. But our message at the end of our life, at the end of the day, has to be it's all about him. We're going to be inconvenienced, but we can't let our sinful nature come out during that inconvenience. Um, we're called to be living. Oh, I can't remember my passcode now. Hold on. There we go. All right. We're called to be living sacrifices. All right. We're called to, to go out there and represent Christ in everything that we do. Today, because we're Christians, we've all made that decision. We've all made, made that decision to make him our Savior. So we gather today in his house to remember what he did on that cross. We take the bread, which represents his body. We take the juice that represents his blood that was poured out for us. All right, And then we're supposed to go on from here, and we share that message, the warning that something is coming. And we need to share that message with other people so we can bring them with us to heaven to help them find shelter, to find protection from what's coming. There's a cost, right? There's a cost that, that Jesus paid for us. And we need to be able to repay that. We need to be able to do everything we can to repay that, to show others for it. Romans 12.1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what's God, what God's will is, 
his good, pleasing, and perfect will. He doesn't want us out there fighting over guests. He doesn't want us out there snapping at our friends and family because we've been cooped up too long. What he does want us out there is what I see. I saw a lot of people doing, and that's reaching out to your community, to your neighbors, to your family and friends, helping them clean up after the storm, giving them a place to do a hot shower or a hot meal. That's what it's all about. And it needs to transfer not only here on the earth, but we've got to make that sure we all get up there in heaven and do the same thing. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you so much for all you've done for us. Lord, I thank you for your son. I thank you for the love, grace, and mercy that comes from him, that we get to experience it. And and Lord, I ask that we take that, we share it with everybody else. We show this broken world, there are so many people out there hurting physically and spiritually and and especially right now after something like this. You know, we get get so caught up in our day-to-day lives that we're inconvenienced, we don't realize people have lost their homes, they've lost their loved ones. Help us be able to take a step back and remember what it's all about. It's all about you. It's all about your sacrifice on the cross. Help us to remember what our true job is, what we're called to do. And help us be able to celebrate with you one day in heaven. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Everybody doing good? All right, very good. Listen, hey, um, need to do something. We always, we've been doing this for the past several, several months that the first Sunday of each month, we've been highlighting a ministry in the church um, and talking a little bit about that and how proud we are of that ministry. Um, I realize this is the second Sunday of the month. Last week, I just lost my mind last week and didn't talk about it. And so I need to apologize for not doing that. So for the next couple of moments, I want you to act like this is the first Sunday of the month. (laughs) And I'm going to talk about this ministry. Uh, we have a lot of different ministries in the church that are wonderful uh, ministries and touch lives. One of the ministries or the ministry I want to highlight this morning is part of our care team ministry. Care team is a, a larger ministry that involves mental health ministry and coaching and mentoring and prayer stuff. But also part of that ministry of our care team is our guest service or our first impressions ministry. First impressions is such a highly needed ministry of the church. It involves people that are door greeters, uh, they help pass out bulletins, they serve communion, um, they uh, plan our welcome table, they deal with kids check-in, all of that stuff, right? Those are the frontline people that you see every Sunday when you come in, someone's opening a door for you, saying hi to you, welcome you, all that kind of stuff, making people feel comfortable being here. And a lot of times, it's easy to sometimes think to yourself, if you're a part of that team, well, I'm, that's just, I don't know, I'm just there. I'm just opening a door. It's not that big a deal. I'm just handing a bulletin out. I'm just passing communion. I'm just doing these kind of things. It's not that big a deal. But here's the thing. It is so critical to the health of the church. Let me give you a, an example of this. Statistically, people that have been, um, that have conducted surveys and stuff like that show that people who come to a church for, for the first time make the decision, right, make the decision whether or not they're going to come back to that church within the first seven minutes of being on that church's campus. That's way before they ever hear the first song. That's way, way before they ever hear me or whoever speaks that Sunday. They make that, their mind up whether or not they're going to come back based on are they welcomed, are they greeted friendly, do they have a place that kids can go to, do they, do they know how to get their kids checked in, all that kind of stuff. So your role is so critical, and I want to say thank you. If you volunteer in that role, uh, whether it's a greeter, whether it's in our kids' check-in, whether it's in here serving, we want to say thank you deeply from the bottom of our hearts. I also would like to say if you're not involved in, in, in a ministry and you're thinking, I'd like to get involved in something, that's a great ministry to get involved in. Brian Palmer leads that ministry. You can send him an email. Give him a phone call. His information is on the back of your bulletin. You can easily do that, and we'd love to get you connected in a ministry uh, like that because it's so, so needed. So if you are part of our First Impressions team, I want to say thank you for your hard work, your dedication, and the instrumental role you play in the kingdom of God. Thank you guys so much. So I'm going to pray for our care team and the work they do, but I'm also going to pray for our offering today as we thank God for being good to us and in return that we also can be good to others around us. And uh, let's, let's pray for that. Father, we thank you. I thank you, God, for the team of people that you've assembled here at Lake Eustis. 
that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people that every week come early, they get up to make coffee, and serve donuts, they get up to open doors and greet people with a smiling face, offer a warm handshake. Lord, I thank you that there is kindness that is showed to our community through this team. I'm thankful for the role they play in the ministry here at Lake Houston, and I pray that would continue. I pray, God, that if there are people sitting here in the rows today that maybe aren't plugged into a ministry, that this might be something they would get involved in. Lord, I pray that you would prompt their heart to make that decision. Lord, I thank you also for your kindness to us and your generosity, that even in a hurricane and even in all this stuff that we've been walking through, you're, you're faithful to us. You supply us with what we need and you are gracious. And God, as we consider giving back to you in our offerings and our tithes, Lord, I pray that you'd be honored in those things. I pray that as we are called to be generous like you're generous, God, that we would do that and be a blessing to others, that we'd be able to fund the ministries that, that continue to go on in our community and bless people. And so we're grateful for that. Thank you for being kind to us and good to us, God. And I pray that in turn, we would do the same for others. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue with our worship together this morning. Who tells the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky? The shades of his glory wakes us with mercy and love. Jesus does. Who holds the orphan and comforts the widow, cries for injustice and feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children. Jesus does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, you saved me from who I was. Cause that's what Jesus does. The heart of the sinner showers his grace over all our mistakes and washes us clean with his blood. Jesus does. Who sings the song of sweet forgiveness? Who stole the keys to hell and the grave? to save Jesus does so we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son praise to the Spirit who's living in us when I was a sinner who saved me from who I was cause that's what Jesus does Church, oh, what a friend. Oh, what a friend. Oh, what a Savior. He's always been good. He's always been faithful. He came to my rescue and I needed him most and saved my soul. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son, praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner,
Listen, hey, we got power back yesterday at our house, and uh, yeah, I was really excited. Here's, here's how that worked out in our family. So we've been working, uh, a lot of people from our church have been going out every day, doing cleanup work and just helping people, and I had the great idea because I, I only have like, uh, I only have a certain number of pants that I wear in my, in my wardrobe, uh, and so I had these pants and I wore them. I don't know, when did the hurricane come? Was that Wednesday? Wednesday it came? Thursday? Anyway, Thursday we started working, right? And so I, I was wearing these pants on Thursday. I wore these pants Thursday. And I realized, like, you know, we don't have power, so we can't wash our clothes. And I was like, well, I'm just going to wear the next, this next day. I'm going to wear the same pants, so I won't have to worry about laundry. So I wore them then. And I wore them on Friday. Then I wore them on Saturday. <laughs> I got home last night, and my, this is the only time I think I've ever heard Michelle tell me this. She said, you need to go outside. Just, just, I don't care where you, just go away from me because I stunk so bad yesterday. And like, you know it's bad when you start smelling yourself, right? That's when it's really, really bad. So I washed those pants last night and uh, I'll be wearing them this afternoon again. So I'll start that whole trend again today. Anyway, uh, we've been having a lot of people just help. And if you are one of those people that have jumped in and helped and served your neighbor, whether that's through the church or just you going out on your own and doing it. I've watched people provide meals, uh, clean debris up, um, wash people's clothes for them. Uh, I mean, give rides to people. I've seen all kinds of things happen over the last couple of days. And it's just, that's what the body of Christ should do, right? That's what we should be about doing. So I appreciate you guys. If you're interested in helping uh, this afternoon, we're going to meet back here at 1.15 this afternoon and head back out and do some more work. So love to have you come and join us if you want to. If you have a chainsaw, that's great. If you don't have a chainsaw, you got two hands and some legs and we'll put you to work. Uh, We'd love to have you come. We're going to be doing some tree stuff. We're also going to be doing, uh, we've got a gentleman that's got a utility shed that was thrown up on his roof, and we're going to figure out how to get that thing off, and uh, we've got a lot of things that we're working on, so love to have you come and join us, 115 here at church, and um, we'll start working. That'd be a good thing. Um, so we're in a series called Ecclesia, right? The church, who we are, the called out ones, the believers of Jesus, the family of God, the body of Christ, and we've been able to watch the body of Christ on display this week, just give care and help to people, exactly what we should be doing, right? So today we're going to talk about the idea that we see in the New Testament of this boldness that the early church had. And, and I, I just need to be honest, like some of the stuff we're going to talk about in here today is somewhat convicting to me, not just as a person individually, but also convicting in terms of like in terms of the church, and I'm just, not just talking about Lake Eustace, but the church, the big C church, like the worldwide church, the, the church that exists on the earth today, in that, I'm convicted in that, you know, I don't know that we have the same boldness that they had in the first century. I'll just be honest. As we're going to read this. I don't know that we have the same boldness. I'm not saying we're not doing good or we're lacking in, in a lot of ways, but I'm just saying there probably should be some more boldness in the way we live. And we see boldness in all kinds of places in the scripture. People like um, Jeremiah, these prophets, right? You got people like uh, Moses, and uh, you got people like uh, Joshua, and these leaders, these great people. Then you got people that show boldness, like the woman who comes and washes Jesus' feet, right? Talking about the vulnerability and the boldness of her to go in her position to a rabbi and wash his feet. You got people like Esther that presented herself to the, queen, to the king to save her people. There's all these amazing stories of boldness all through the scripture. We're going to look at a couple of those here this morning in the book of Acts. I read a story this week about great boldness. I think this is an awesome story, a very funny story to me. Uh, here's how this story plays out. There's a young man, just got a new job, and uh, he's on a business trip with his boss. And this is... This is years ago, they're on his business trip, and he's with his boss, and his boss, he doesn't like that much. He doesn't get along with the boss at all, right? Just can't stand the boss. 
doesn't want to be around him, but he's on this business trip. They get put on a, on a, on a train that, to travel across states, and they sit down on the train, and as they sit down on the train, the people sitting opposite them, right across from them, looking at them, facing each other, is a young woman, right, about the same age as this young man, early 20s. She's beautiful, right, just stunningly beautiful. And she's, her companion is her grandmother, right? So you've got a young woman is beautiful, a grandmother, and then you've got this young man riding with his boss, and they're all on the train together. And as soon as they sit down, the young man and the young woman start making eyes at each other, and he recognizes how pretty she is, and he starts flirting a little bit with her, and she's kind of returning the, the flirting stuff, and they're back and forth, and grandma's having none of it, right? <laughs> grandma's like, I don't like this guy, he's too forward, she's making her uh, unapproval well known to them, and she's kind of saying things like, hey, you don't talk to that guy, all that kind of stuff. This goes on for a little while, and about, about 45 minutes, an hour into the train ride, the train enters into a tunnel that goes underground, and everything goes dark. No lights, n- the, nothing inside. I mean, it's complete darkness. And at the same time, all four people there in those seats hear the same thing. They hear the smack of lips together, and then followed by a smack of a hand. They come out of the tunnel, and every, all the lights come back on, and all four of those people have this sheepish grin on their face. And they're all thinking different things. The young woman who was sitting there, the young pretty woman, was thinking to herself, I'm so glad that he finally kissed me, but I'm so sad that my grandma slapped him for kissing me. (laughs) The the, grandma says to herself, I can't believe that guy would actually kiss my granddaughter but at least he got what's coming to him, and I'm glad she slapped him that day. I like that. I was like, I don't remember that being part of my joke. I don't even know what I was talking about now. So let me go back, right? They come out of the tunnel, right? They come out of the tunnel. Is that going to happen again? I'm not sure. So I, let, me, let me tell you something really funny about this this morning. This morning, our 8 o'clock service, uh, Diane was running our computer over there, and there's all kind of buttons and stuff on our computer. And she said to me, as I'm getting ready to come on stage, she goes, ooh, I found some new buttons that have sound effects, Brent. And I thought, oh, that's really scary that you have found that. So maybe, maybe they found the button that has sound effects. I don't know. So they come out of the tunnel, right? They've heard the kiss. They heard the slap. Someone got slapped. The, lady, the young lady says, I'm glad he finally kissed me, um, but I wish my grandma hadn't slapped him. The grandma says, I can't believe that guy kissed my granddaughter, and, uh, but at least she slapped him and paid him back for what he did wrong. The boss says to himself, I can't believe that my employee had the nerves to kiss that girl, and then I can't believe that the grandma slapped me instead of slapping him. <laughs> All the while, the young man sitting in his chair leans back and says, I can't believe I got away. I kissed the prettiest girl on the train, and I slapped my boss at the same time. <laughs> that's pretty good. That's, that's bold, right? That's a, that's a good, bold move. Today, we're going to talk about the early church boldness, right? They had a different kind of boldness than I think, honestly, the church today has. If you have your Bible, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 here this morning. And we're going to look at the boldness of the early church. The first picture we see of the early church and their boldness was their bold action on the part of the early church, right? They had this action of boldness, right? And what they did and how they lived and how they acted and all these different things. Now, one of the things we know in the first century is that as the church began, right, we started last week, Acts chapter 2, with the birth of the church, and the day of Pentecost, the church grew, 3,000 people became followers of Jesus. Immediately after, in Acts chapter 4, we see this tension beginning to build. Chapter 3, you see a little bit of the tension, and the tension was between the religious leaders and the church. The religious leaders who had done it their way all along, now they had tension with the church. So it says this in chapter 4, verse 1. The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. 
And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Now, in the first century, there were a couple of groups of religious leaders, right? There was what we call the Pharisees. We know those people because those are the people that disagreed with Jesus. They had all this beef with Jesus, always had this confrontation with Jesus. There were these religious leaders that were fixed the Old Testament law, and they didn't believe that the Messiah really had come, so they had problems with Jesus. You got another group of people called the Sadducees. Uh, these were another religious elite group of people that um, were like the Pharisees. They were very strict adherents to the law, uh, but they had a different version of truth. Their idea was that there was no resurrection, that the resurrection wasn't even a possibility, that when you died, you just died, right? And that was it. They didn't believe in the resurrection, so they had issue with Jesus being preached And then you had this group called the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like a a mixture of all these groups. It was kind of like their version of a Supreme Court. That's what it was like. The Jewish ruling council was the Sanhedrin. And so that's what's going on here in chapter four, is that the church was growing and, and preaching about Jesus. The religious elite people and these other rabbis were upset at the church because all these people were leaving their teaching and following the way of Jesus. And so they throw people like Peter and John in prison because of their stance. They finally bring Peter and John in, and in chapters 4, verse 7, it says this. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. And they said, by what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if being called to a, if being a, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame because he healed someone the day before and are being asked how he was healed then know this you and all the people of Israel it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead that this man stands before you healed Jesus is the stone you builders rejected which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given uh, under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Now, a couple things that we see in this text here. One is that the message of the gospel for the early church was most important. It was the message of the good news, the hope of Jesus Christ, the salvation of mankind that has come to earth through the form of Jesus. In a moment of their life, in this season of their life where their life was on the line, right? Where Peter and John were thrown in prison, the early church, they were being arrested, thrown in prison, they were being persecuted for their faith. What do they do? They go on and continue to preach. They go out and continue to preach about this gospel because they knew how important the gospel was. I mean, you think about that in our culture today. If for some reason it became illegal for us to pronounce the name of Jesus and talk about his faithfulness and his goodness and his salvation, what would we do? If you were arrested for that, what would be your defense if you went in front of the judge? For Peter and John, it's so crazy The thing that they are arrested for doing, as soon as they're questioned, Peter says the same exact thing. He he does not back down. He continues to preach the same news. He continues to tell them what they are doing and why he is doing what he is doing. It reminds me of Paul's words in Romans chapter one. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. They recognize the power was in the gospel. The power was in the saving work of Jesus, which is the good news that Jesus had given to mankind. And for them, the message of the gospel was most important. They were not going to back down just because of the threats. They, the church, as well as the disciples, they were unwilling to compromise. There was this unwillingness to compromise the truth of Jesus Christ, the message of Jesus Christ. And it would be really tempting to back down. It'd be really tempting to say, well, you know what? I don't want to really get in trouble, so I'll just, I'll tone it down a little bit. I'll tame down my speech. 
I'll change some words here or I'll change some ideas here so it doesn't make so many people upset. But just because it wasn't popular didn't mean that Peter and the disciples wavered. Actually, I would say anything but wavered. They just spoke it with more boldness. To the people who were arresting them, to the people who were accusing them of preaching about Jesus, this is what Peter says to the, to the crowd or to the Sanhedrin. Verse 10. I think that's verse 10. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 10. He says, It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom Christ raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. You know what Peter's doing there? Peter is talking. I think that we, we miss it sometimes. Peter is talking here to the same exact people that just a little over a month ago had Jesus killed. These are the same exact people. The same people that got the masses together and betrayed Jesus and turned Jesus into the Romans. These are the same exact people that Peter's saying, you killed Jesus. You're the one that murdered Jesus. You're the one that put Jesus on the cross. You talk about boldness. Oh, an unwillingness to compromise the truth of God. Verse 18, it goes on. It says, then they called them in, talking about Peter and John, called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to, listen to, you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Peter says, I don't care how much you threaten me. I don't care what you say about me. I don't care what you do to me. I am not going to cave on the truth of God. In a world today, listen, in a world today that we live in where there are, sadly, there are churches and there are individuals who are watering down the truth of the scripture in order to fit an agenda of the world. It is happening all around us. And I will say, we're, that's not who we are. That's not who we're going to be. We're, we're not going to bend to the wokeness of our world today because we want to please people, because we want to, as Paul writes to Timothy, we don't want to have people's, we don't want to itch itching ears, is what Paul says. He says there's going to be a day that people are going to want to have their ears itch. means they're going to, they're going to want to hear what they want to hear. But we're not going to be those people. We're going to be people who are committed with boldness to the truth. I think one of the reasons why the, the church in the early centuries was able to be bold is because another factor was that they prayed bold prayers. There was a boldness in the prayers of the early church. They were willing to say things that, you know, I just don't know if we talk like this anymore. I don't know if we pray like this. I want you to think about your prayer life for a moment. Just think about your prayer life and the time you spend with the Lord as you're talking with the Lord Think about what your prayer life looks like. Think about how often you pray to God. What does it look like? And then I want you to think about the prayers that we're going to read here in just a few moments from the early church. And I want you to think about how different maybe those prayers are. This was really convicting to me as I read this again this week of, of the fact that my prayer life sometimes is lacking. My prayer life is sometimes very superficial rather than robust like we see it in the early church. Remember in chapter four, we're still in this season where the disciples and the early church was getting, were getting into trouble with the religious leaders. Some of them were being put in prison. Some of them were being persecuted. This is all happening here. There were a lot of threats against the church. And so in chapter four, the church begins to pray. And you can read the whole prayer. Their whole prayer kind of starts in verse 23. But in chapter, 20, or in chapter four, starting in verse 29, I want to read these words. This is the last part of their prayer. They said this. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I want you to think about what they actually prayed there. I'm going to read that one line again. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness boldness. A couple of things about this. One is their prayers were not about protection, but rather about courage. You notice that? You think about that. They had all these threats against them. Threats to throw them in prison, threats to take their property, threats to murder them. We see, we see people dying for their faith here in the next couple of chapters. 
<clears throat> and they pray, God, would you give us boldness? Notice what they don't pray. They don't pray, God, would you, would you eliminate the threat? They, they don't pray, God, would you save us from these, these hard, harsh men? That's not what they pray about. They say, God, in the face of all this hardship, give us boldness. Let us, let us preach a good news to the world. It's convicting because often when I pray, that's not normally what I pray about. You know, when we, when we send people off on trips and we go out and do work and stuff like that, you know what we often pray about? We often pray, like, we're sending kids on a mission trip, or we're sending adults on a mission trip. We pray, God, would you give them safe travel? God, would you keep them healthy so nobody gets sick? God, would you make sure there's not too much traffic on I-75 as we're driving north, right? We pray those kind of things. And sometimes we mask it, right? And we'll say, God, keep us safe so that we can then go do your work. Or God, keep us protected and healthy so that we can talk about Jesus. And I'm not saying we're, we're not true in those prayers, but that's not their prayer. Their prayer wasn't, Lord, can you please keep us safe so that we can talk about Jesus? They say, regardless of what happens to us, Jesus, we just want boldness. We want to be able to speak about you no matter what happens to us. And their prayers were just different. Their prayers were focused on others rather than focused on themselves. You see that over and over and over again. Their prayers were totally focused on other people and not the self. That wasn't just the early church, but that's the Apostle Paul as well. He's always praying for other people. He's lifting up others. You see that after example after example in the New Testament. And you see it in the character of their prayers. When they prayed, they prayed, God, give us boldness so that we can preach the gospel. Why? Because they know the gospel changes lives. They know the gospel restores families. They know the gospel redeems people. They know the gospel saves people from their sins. And it's always about the other person, not themselves. Their prayers were always about that other person. So God, give us boldness so the other people can be saved, so that our neighbors can know Jesus, so that our children can come to know you as Lord. It was always about others. And then also we see there was a bold faith that they had in the face of persecution. We get into chapter 5 here and we see that persecution begins to ramp up against the church and the disciples. In chapter 5 we see this great story of faith. We see that in chapter 5, about midway through chapter 5, the Jewish leaders again are upset. They arrest the disciples. They throw them in prison. Sometime during that night in prison, God sends an angel to open the doors of the prison. They leave. They get outside. They're freed. The next day, the religious leaders get together again. They, they go and they say, hey, call the disciples in. We're going to put them on trial. They go to the jail to find them, and they're not there. And they're like, where are the disciples? And someone says, hey, isn't that those? Aren't those the guys that you just arrested? They're in the temple courts, and they're preaching and teaching about Jesus. The very same thing that got them in trouble the day before, they're out preaching about Jesus the same way they were before. Now, listen. I don't know about you, but for some reason, I can be driving down the road, right? Everything's good. I'm going the speed limit. I'm doing everything right. I look in my rearview mirror, and I find that there's a police officer behind me. I get nervous. I don't, am I the only one that does that? Like, immediately, I'm like, oh, man, did I, did I renew my tag? Are my blinkers working? Do I have my tag light working? I immediately, I, I could be doing nothing wrong at all. But something inside of me goes, uh-oh. That happens to me when I'm hunting in the woods, right? If you see, we call them green jeans. They're the game wardens, right? If you see a game warden in the woods, like, I get nervous. I haven't done anything wrong, but there's something about that. I'm like, what is, what, have I done anything wrong? You start getting right. You second guess yourself. Here the disciples are. They get arrested on a Tuesday. I don't know if it was a Tuesday. They get arrested on a Tuesday, they get thrown in prison. They get set free out of prison that night. Wednesday morning, they're right back in the temple preaching the same thing that got them in prison the day before. Like, if that were me, I would have been like, I, I got to move towns. I'm going to get out of here. I'm not going to be around. I mean, I would have not had the courage, I don't think, to stand up and do the same thing. So eventually, the disciples get brought back into the Sanhedrin. That's that Jewish ruling court, the, the council there. 
There's a whole big discussion that takes place all the way through chapter five. And the, and the, the religious leaders are like, do we let them go? Do we, what, do we, what do we do with them? How do we stop this preaching about Jesus that they wanted to do? Eventually, there's a guy that gets up. His name is Gamaliel. He speaks and says, hey, this, we need to let him go. If it's a God thing, let it go, whatever. So they decide they're going to let him go. But this is how it plays out. Verse 40. It says his speech, that guy that spoke on behalf of the disciples, his speech persuaded them. So they called the apostles in and had them flogged. I don't want us to just skip over that word, right? We, we sometimes just read over that like, oh, they got a slap on the wrist and that's it. The idea of flogging, and we know what flogging is, right? That's what happened to Jesus before he went to the cross. I mean, whipped and beaten on their exposed back. I mean, a lot of people died from flogging itself. It says the apostles were flogged. Then they ordered the apostles not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Here's the thing. I don't, I recognize that this is happening across the globe today in other countries. I know that people are persecuted for their faith. We have freedom in America right now, and we don't experience this. But I wonder, what would be our response? If suddenly our culture in America turned to where we could not preach about Jesus legally and publicly, what would we do? Would we have the boldness of the early Christians to say, I don't care what they do, I'm going to preach the gospel because it is the power of God? Would we do that? I don't know. Here's the thing. They had a different approach. Their, their thought was this. They considered hardship to be refinement. For as us, I think a lot of times when we experience hardship, we, we want to complain about it and like mope about it and why do we have this and I, I haven't had power in three days, Right? What am I going to do? How am I going to cook my chicken nuggets, right? This hardship that we have with the hurricane. We think of hardship as this big ordeal. They looked at it as God's just refining me. He's grooming me. He's shaping me into the image of his son. Also, we see the early church here. They never stopped teaching the good news. Even when they were suffering, even when they were in prison, even when they were afflicted, they never stopped teaching the gospel. And it wasn't just with their lips that they were teaching, but it was also by their action and their mannerisms. We're going to talk about that next week, the impact of their service to the community. So let me ask us a couple of questions here this morning as we wrap up. These are questions I want you to just kind of take home and think and chew on for a little bit. First one, how or are you bold in how you use your voice? Are you willing to be bold in how you use your voice? We're really quick to, to brag about our college football team, right? Or we're really quick to brag about our, our family and something they've done. But man, are, we, are we vocal about the gospel of Jesus? We live in a world today that in the push of a button, our voice can be heard all over the world, right? With social media, are we using that for the glory of God? Second of all, are you willing to step out in faith even if it means hardship? Like, are we willing to step out in faith if your faith costs you a job or if it costs you a promotion or if it costs you a relationship? Are you willing to stand on your faith? And then third is, are you, are you going to remain faithful even if no one else is? Someone asked me years ago, they asked, are you a people pleaser or a Christ pleaser? Because you're probably not going to be both. You're probably not going to be both. You've got to choose who you're going to live to please. Where is your loyalty? Is your loyalty to Jesus or is your loyalty to your own comfort? And the people in the early church, their loyalty was to Christ. It was the mission of God. It was the gospel of Jesus. Our final thought is this, that Christ-like boldness includes spirit-empowered conviction, courage, and urgency. You see all of that in the early church a conviction to preach the gospel, a courage to defy the enemy, and an urgency that said, I cannot sit idle and not do this. Is that us? Is that you? Let's pray. 
Father, I pray that that would be true of us. That, God, we would be willing to risk it all for you. And honestly, Father, in the world we live in, in America that we live in, that's, it's not hard to live for you. Honestly, Father. You've given us every resource we need just to say yes to you. Yes, there's obstacles and yes, there's challenges. But Father, out of all the people in the world, we have, we have it so easy. Yet so often we depend on ourselves rather than to depend on you. So Lord, I just pray that you would give us an urgency, a conviction that is led by your spirit, God, that we would want to live for your glory and for the kingdom of God rather than ourselves. That when we face adversity, when we face hardship, when we face pushback, God, we wouldn't just quit and cave, but God, we'd push forward, knowing, God, that you have called us to something greater. So Lord, I pray that you give us that same boldness and that same courage that the early church had, that we might honor your name. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand this morning. We're going to close with a song. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. If you guys want to come back here at 115. We're going to get ready to take off and go out and help some people in the community. So we'd love to have you come and join us for that. Hope you guys have a great day. Let's sing and worship as we close.
addictions come lay them down at the foot of the cross jesus is waiting god so loved the world amen you guys have a great rest of your sunday we'll see you